Hi again, I'm Jack Lessonberry, and welcome and welcome back to Politics and Prejudices, the podcast. For many years, I wrote a nationally award-winning column, Politics and Prejudices, and did radio essays in both public and commercial radio. And this is meant to be a blend of both and what, for many people, is still a fairly new format. So I hope you enjoy today's installment and keep listening. By the way, I'm still doing a lot of writing, and you can view some of my longer and shorter form work and listen to past new essays and podcasts on my website and blog, LessonBerryInc.com. That's ink as an ink pen. Over the years, I've covered stories in many states, many countries, some of which no longer exist. Along the way, I've met a lot of fascinating people. What I'm trying to do with these podcasts is bring some of them and their stories to you. Plus, give you my unique and sometimes slightly sarcastic view of things. By the way, I also plan to end most of these podcasts with my signature essays, so please settle in and listen. Hope you enjoy today's podcast. Please keep following me, and I'd love to hear from you in terms of a message on Facebook or to my blog. And now, let's get down to today's topic. We know that every 10 years, the U.S. Census Bureau attempts to count the entire population. It's done so every decade starting in 1790, and next April 1st, it'll do so again. The census has always been important, now more than ever, because it plays such a big role in government for all of us, and how much aid states and communities get for particular programs, how many representatives they'll have in the legislature and Congress, and how their districts will be shaped. For Michigan, the census may be more important than ever before. We've lost five seats in Congress since 1980, a whole lot of clout and influence with them. We may lose another next year, which is why making sure everyone's counted is so important. There's something else going on, too. Michigan's legislature is one of the most gerrymandered in the nation. The districts have been designed to produce Republican majorities, even when most people vote for Democrats. The last year, a grassroots movement rose up against this and amended the Michigan Constitution to turn redistricting over to a panel made up of average citizens, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. The people passed it by nearly a million votes. Republicans are still fighting against it by suing in federal court, and the legislature has been trying to cut the funding for the redistricting commission to take back control of the process. Joining us today to explain all this is Kurt Metzger, who's probably Michigan's best-known demographer and population expert. After working for the U.S. Census Bureau for years, he ran a program at Wayne State, went on to work for United Way, and then found data-driven Detroit. Today, he still studies demographic trends and keeps an eye on the population as mayor of Pleasant Ridge. And Nancy Wang is now executive director of Voters Not Politicians, the grassroots citizens group that last year caused a revolution that led to a major change in the way state legislative and congressional districts will be drawn after the next year's census. He's a founding member of the group and also has both engineering and law degrees from the University of Michigan, where she's also taught environmental law. Nancy Kurt, thanks for being with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Nancy, let's start with you. What's now going on with redistricting in the state, and why are people still fighting it? I thought the voters settled all that last year. Well, we did, but, you know, as we know, and as we expected from the very beginning, uh, people who hold on to power and who have uh, benefited from gerrymandering the last two cycles are not going to give up that easily. And so um, what we are doing is we set up a system where um, a commission of citizens, like you mentioned, uh, will be uh, formed starting later this year, actually. So voters, not politicians, what we've been Uh, focusing on is really getting out the word and telling people all across the state that this is our time now, that people get to draw the maps. Now, there'll be four Republicans, four Democrats, and five independents. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Well, let's say a young mayor like Kurt wanted to be on the commission. How would he apply? Well, uh, we've been in, um, you know, close consultation with the Secretary of State's office. Um, Her office is going to be administering the um, application process, and it'll be a really easy process, actually. There are going to be um, opening uh, an online portal sometime in early November of this year, so pretty soon. And you can simply fill out a form, and then you'll have to print it out and get it notarized. Um, that's something that Voters Not Politicians is working on to make sure that we have notaries all across the state who will volunteer to notarize your application for free, and then that'll be that. And who picks them from that pool? It's a, um, largely based on random selection. Uh-huh. Now, how do you know people are honest? How do you know people who might, let's say you had a Democrat say he was really masquerading as an independent. How would you find that out? Well, there's a, um, a couple <coughs> you know, overlapping safeguards in the amendment language itself. Um, so, you know, voters, not politicians, um, we crafted the language with all of this kind of our Michigan's history and, you know, um, all of these possible... Well, we, any, any kind of way that people could game the system we had in mind when we crafted the language. Now, who's and, ineligible? Sitting politicians, sitting office holders are not eligible, Yeah, correct? there's a list of disqualification disqualif- criteria in the amendment language, and then that will include, you know, s- sitting politicians, partisan politicians, 
Um, so um, Kirk could serve if if uh, his office is nonpartisan, nonpartisan, which is great. Oh, good. So then I encourage you to apply. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if you're uh, a registered lobbyist agent, um, you know, all of the people basically that you would think would in be ineligible because they have the greatest um, uh, conflict of interest in drawing lines to benefit themselves or a party. Well, two last questions before we turn to Kurt. Number one, I'm confused because, as I understand it, the Republicans are still suing on the grounds that this is unconstitutional. Didn't they file a similar lawsuit that got thrown out before you got on the ballot? That's right. So when we were um, in the campaign, they tried to keep us off the ballot, um, and they sued then in, in state court. And now that we've um, won, and it's you know the language is in the Constitution, um, now the Re Michigan Republican Party and then certain Republican operatives have sued us now in federal court. So they're basically trying everything they can to um, tear down what the people adopted in 2018. The other thing is, as our, if I'm... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the governor asked for an appropriation of $4.6 million for you to do right. the work. They tried to cut it to $3.4 million. We don't know yet exactly how that will turn out, but what would a cut of that magnitude mean? Well, um, again, you know, when we were, all of, all of the things we put in place in the amendment language was by design, right? And mm -hmm. so we looked at what other um, independent citizens commissions in other states have uh, needed to spend um, to, to um, administer the process and draw fair lines. And, you know, we really came up to um, the point where, you know, based on the state's population here in Michigan, uh, relative to those other states we were looking at, um, and the fact that Michigan in 2021 uh, will be drawing, you know, it'll be having to start from scratch, essentially, because our lines are the right. most gerrymandered in the, in the country. And so we really do need something between 3 and $4 million um, in order to ensure that that uh, commission can do its work. Kurt, we're coming up to the census here. You've worked with the census. You've worked for the census, presided over everything. Michigan was the only state in the last census to have actually lost population. How That's do, right. How do things look now? Well, uh, Michigan is slowly gaining population. We've at least gotten back to where we were in 2000, and we've exceeded that, so we're above 10 million. Um, but we are, so that's that's the good news. The The, the bad news is that even though we are increasing our population, we have, we're nowhere near what's going on in the uh, states in the southeast, the south, the southwest, and the western parts of the country. So for all the projections that we have right now, unless something drastic changes, Michigan will lose another seat after mm. the 2020 census. So then redistricting becomes even more important because we're going to go from 14 to 13 seats. Probably southeast Michigan will be mostly affected just because of the population um, trends in the, in the, across the state. And so it's going to be very important to have this redistricting commission put together and get a nonpartisan um, job done. Now, Nancy, does the redistricting commission have any specific instructions about keeping communities together, for example? If you look at some of our districts now, let's say the 14th Congressional District, it looks like some kind of bug that's been squished. Of course, the term gerrymander came about because they had a district that somebody thought looked like a salamander. Are there, is there any charter they're getting? Absolutely. So the amendment language uh, requires the commission to follow certain um, criteria and priority order, and communities of interest is, is towards the top of that list. So at the very top is, um, you know, the Voting Rights Act. They still have to abide by that. Um, but also, you know, a central part of um, the new process will be that maps need to be drawn around our existing communities of interest. Now, the Voting Rights Act, correct me if I'm wrong, specifies that there should be two districts that have a majority-minority population. Right. Kurt, that's getting, in 1970, it was relatively easy to do because black folks all lived in Detroit. Right. It's not as easy anymore, is it? It's not as easy because of the distribution of African-American population outside out of, the, out of Detroit, and that's why you see the 13th district, um, which starts in Pontiac and goes through Farmington Hills and... You know, just is is really a strange. I mean, you talk about a gerrymandered district. Right. That was the way they were able to grab and and really force and push um, majority uh, minority districts. So, it's it's certainly possible. I mean, the the numbers are are high enough, but but it will require um, some interesting drawing. I mean, I think you can do it and do it in a much better way than than was done um, the last time. Nancy, is there any thought that maybe the Voting Rights Act isn't needed anymore, or, or the provision that calls for two minority 
dist uh, majority districts. Is there any school of thought that that's no longer required? Or um, I have not. I have not heard that. Um, you know, I think that be, uh, remains a priority uh, to make sure that um, our minority populations um, have voting power to elect the uh, candidates of their choice. In in the past redistricting, even when it hasn't been. <coughs> Partisan gerrymandering, it's been done mainly as an incumbent protection thing. Is that going to be off now? Yes, no. yes. Uh, the amendment uh, specifically uh, prohibits drawing maps that uh, to benefit, unfairly benefit one party or a candidate, you know, including incumbent. I should say, by the way, that this is that the phenomenon of gerrymandering is not exclusively Republican. In Illinois and Maryland, where Democrats control the legislature, they gleefully did the same thing. That's exactly so, right. And they probably would have done so here had they had the opportunity. But Democrats have been, it, it's been since 19, 1960, I think was the last time that they had a governor, and they never had both houses of the legislature. So this has sort of been a self. It's gotten worse and worse as the process has gone along. Um, Talk a little bit how the population of Michigan is changing. And uh, other than in terms of numbers, demographically, how are we getting different? Well, I think, I guess I would say that the most um, relevant piece of it is Michigan's getting older. Um, and I was looking at some numbers that just came out last week. Um, Michigan is second in the country in terms of the percentage of its population that was born in the state. And that is one of the factors that continues to hurt Michigan because we do not attract people from other parts of the country. But the part of the auto boom is exactly the opposite. Right, right. I mean, and, that, and that's the problem. We're not, we're not bringing people in. We are second only to Louisiana, which is strange. Um, but so 76% of our population was born in the state. And when you, look at, when you break it down even further, so we talk about trying to attract young, educated population, the millennials, we're looking at that. We're not doing much better there either, and we're doing much worse than most states in the country. So what's happening is we're not attracting young people. We're getting older. Um, because women are delaying marriage, delaying childbirth nationally, it's even more, and it's more pronounced in Michigan, and we're just not having children. So what we're seeing is the population of Michigan is aging faster than the country as a whole and in fact many other states, and we need to figure out how to change that. That, and it, again, we are also changing, certainly um, our diversity has been growing, and so increases in, particularly in the Asian community, in the Latino community, also the African American, the white non-Hispanic, which we call the majority population, has been dropping, has been, um, actually is less now, and that's because the white population tends to be older and is dying at a higher rate than other groups. Gee, that makes me feel good. <clears throat> hey, well, well, you know, it makes if, me feel good, too. I'm on that uh, cusp. So. If, we, if we're getting older, yeah. and obviously older people don't reproduce as much as younger people. Not as much, no. Why are we still increasing, or even a little bit? Well, you're still having more births than deaths. That's right. one thing. And we are um, increasing population through immigration. So we're still getting up to 18,000 direct immigrants uh, a year, that's the average, and then we get a lot of secondary uh, migration. So people come into other states and then tend to move to Michigan. So between immigration and more births and deaths, um, that's, how we, that's how we grow. We're sending more people to other parts of the country than we're bringing in from other parts of the country. And all these factors, births have been going down, deaths have been going up. So are there more births than deaths still in Michigan? Yes, yes. But there are about 40 counties in Michigan, I think 43 counties in Michigan, where there are actually more deaths than births. There are a couple of counties where the average age is over 50, I think. We have, a... we have 23 counties there where the median age is 50 or more, which is higher than any state in the country. And you see these, and of course we're talking the Upper Peninsula and the northern part of the, the Lower Peninsula in many cases, um, and we're seeing not people, the only people moving in tend to be retirees that may have had a, a, a second home up there. They're moving in, but they're obviously not having children. And so the population in all those counties tends to be dropping. You told me once many years ago that in Detroit, the people moving in were new, newly wed and the almost dead. Right. And, and that is hard to keep people of sort of childbearing uh, age. Once they have children, they tend to leave. But... Mayor Duggan has sort of staked his reputation on the population of Detroit increasing. Is it yet? 
I keep saying that it is. I keep waiting, and and again, we're we're subject, and we won't go into the details. Subject to the methods that the Census Bureau uses to estimate the population. Um, I think by virtue of what the the, the development in the city in terms of um, uh, new housing and the fact that most of the housing that's being demolished is actually vacant housing. Um, which except when a state legislator lives in it. Except when yeah. it happened the other day. Well, she wasn't living yeah. there, but oh, she was she, she was fixing it up for someone else, I guess. <laughs> um, but but uh, so Detroit kind of gets penalized by some of the methodology. But I I do think that Duggan will reach that. I'm you know the question is I don't think there's going to be another estimate before the census. There will might be a 2019 estimate that comes out sometime during the census process. Um, I think it's gained, although the data still show it just let's, slowly losing. Let's put you on the spot. The last okay. estimate I saw was 672,000 right. people. Right. What, what would you think it's going to be? I'm going with 695. 695. Well, that would be quite a... Quite, quite, That's quite today. A it might be different. <laughs> That's today. Nancy, I'm sort of intrigued by this whole redistricting process. You're doing something that's never been tried before. As far as is there any other state that's done anything like this? Sure, there's uh, independent citizens uh, commissions in Arizona and California, uh, and then in the last redistricting cycle, um, in, in I mean, excuse me, in the last election, 2018, um, there were other states besides Michigan, um, Utah, Colorado, for example, who um, where voters also voted in uh, new uh, commissions to draw their maps. But has the one in Arizona already gone to work? Yeah, yeah, they've worked, um, they've drawn the maps for two cycles now. And don't I, do I remember correctly, the U.S. Supreme Court said there was also a lawsuit. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court said the voters had the right to do that? Correct. So I'm not quite sure what the thinking is of people who are challenging the Michigan. Well, um, right now in, in the federal lawsuits that we're coming up against, um, uh, they're bringing other uh, different co constitutional claims. So they're claiming, for example, that the Michigan Republican Party um, should have the right to handpick the Republican uh, members of the state of the Independent Redistricting Commission, which, of course, you know, the whole point right. was to get partisan bias out of redistricting. Um, and then uh, others are arguing also that, um, you know, they shouldn't be disqualified from the commission just because, you know, their spouse is a sitting uh, Republican or a Democrat, a Democratic lawmaker, for example. Jeffrey Figer once told me that if you don't have the law on your side, argue the facts. If you don't have the facts on your side, argue the law. If you don't have either, pound the table. So <laughs> maybe there's They're some pounding other away. <laughs> but, but I'm good. I mean, are there going to be, do you have any butterflies at all? I would about the whole process itself. Are there going to be deadlines that by a certain date they have to have this much of it done? Well, they need to draw the maps by November of 2021. But no, I don't have butterflies. I have just excitement. Um, we have a lot of um, experienced commissioners from Arizona and California, for example, that have been coming um, into the state and uh, advising us. Um, and, you know, everyone is very um, excited uh, to teach, you know, to, to, to um, help Michigan um, have a really successful, nonpartisan, fair process for the first time in a very long time. Like forever. Um, <laughs> are you going to have teams of demographers like Kurt, for example, to sort of help them? Because you know, if you had a nice man like Mark Pastoria, engineer, who came in, I, or me, I would have a hard time sort of making, how do we draw these lines? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So the commission, um, and that's part of uh, why this budget is so important, the commission has its own budget, um, and it can hire its own experts. But another beautiful thing about the new process is going to be that all of everything is transparent. So if any, you know, citizen, a demographer, or anyone um, wants to give input to the commission, then everyone will um, see that input and, and the commission can use it. So that's quite a dramatic change, way. too, because I remember last time the legislature said, here it is. Correct. <laughs> here it is. Take it or leave it, and we vote to take it. Yeah. So people... Now, there has to be... Does there have to be a majority of each set? Now, you've got four Republicans, four Democrats, five independents. Do I remember correctly you have to have a majority of each one approving every no. decision? To approve a map, you need a majority of the commission. So there's 13 commissioners altogether, right. so you need at least seven. But of that seven, you need at least two Republicans, two Democrats, and two independents or third-party members. So right. obviously that's only six, so you need one from you know another you know, one of the buckets, but you, need, um, you don't need a majority of, of each of the buckets. So I suspect any party could then block it or deadlock it. They decided if you had all the Democrats saying no, there's no way that particular plan could be approved. Well, 
uh, the amendment act actually has some safeguards against that. So there, um, you know, in, in the case of a deadlock, mm -hmm. um, then there's a, a runoff voting provision. So then all the commissioners would um, submit their maps, um, which all have to uh, uh, comply with the criteria. So they all have to be, you know, constitutional. Um, and then there's a, 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 a rank choice voting um, procedure that takes. Tell us about rank choice voting. So it's it's just um, a way for everyone to uh, it's like instant runoff. Right. Um, so each commissioner would uh, propose, you know, the state um, Senate maps, for example, and then all of the commissioners would um, vote. You know, they would rank choice like they they would say, well, you know, this map is my first choice. This is my second choice, whatever. And then the last, the least most popular, um, the least popular would um, be, thrown out. be thrown out. And then you know, you kind of like. Iterate until you get to the first choice of everybody. Will they vote? Will they vote just once on legislative and once on congressional, or there be a series of uh, votes? No, they would vote once. Um, in, in, again, this is in the case of a deadlock, and you know we're talking about right. independent citizens commissions, right? And so right. our experience tells us that when you put regular people on these commissions, they want to do the right thing, and they right. and they end up they work together very very well. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. That's got to be done. Will these be televised? I wonder, or, yeah, well, um, you know, that's something that the commission will, um, that's one of the decisions um, that they will make, but um, they're required to make uh, all of these, um, uh, the whole process as, as publicly available and um, accessible as possible. Great. And Kurt, back to the census, yeah, I certainly understand why in 1790 we had an undercount, but today um, we have spy satellites. You can find anybody anywhere on social media. It's hard to hide. How can we still have an undercount? Um, people don't want to be counted. Mm. Um, and, Why? Well, for any number of reasons, and I'm not, you know, I, of course, want to be counted, but but there are a lot of people who obviously don't trust government. No, um, they, they, I've, I've talked to people who said, well, if they find me, they'll use it because I've got a warrant out against me. The census doesn't right. do that, right? No, I mean, the census, it's, it's confidential, right. totally. None of the information that you put in your census form will be uh, shared with anybody, and it's, it's held confidential for 72 years before it's actually released. Um, but I think people, if, especially if they're worried about... Um, getting some certain kinds of, um, of benefits that they may or may not um, um, qualify for. A lot of times when you have people who are temporarily living in a house or just kind of moving from household to household, they don't get, they pur purposely don't put their names on. People do not put children, a lot of, you know, children under the age of five tend to be one of the large groups not, not counted. And People don't necessarily want to list them for various reasons. Again, programmatically, they may not want to list them, or sometimes they don't even think about it. And sometimes it's just it really is just a matter of not actually knowing, understanding the rules, and, and just leaving somebody off. Does the census count undocumented people? Yes. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, we, we had the big issue around the citizenship question, right. which, thank goodness, seems to have been taken care of. Um, if they'd had the most experts think that they had the citizenship question asking, "Are you a citizen?" That would help exacerbate the undercount. Right, because people are afraid. I mean, you you put a citizenship question certainly in, with this administration, and you know that folks are going to be targeted. And again, it's not one of those situations where you have to. Um, your name is going to be the information is going to be shared. I mean, the confidentiality could be there, but when the census data come out they are actually give information down to the block level so that if you had a number of people who actually responded and said we are non-citizens, it would be easy for the government to do targeting. I mean, the right. ICE, ICE could come to those blocks and just start, not that they don't already have their ways, um, but the citizenship question really was, was frightening. And so now the, the big concern is, okay, so now they lost the citizenship question. What's the next way of scaring people around the census. And that and that's one of the big issues. The census is going to be online for the first time, that people will get an ID in, in March. You will it get will a, be online. It, yeah, in not, March, for the first time, in March, you will get a card in the mail, if you're in the, the mail out, mail back areas, and it will give you a unique ID, which will allow you to go online to fill the census questionnaire out, or make a phone call and give information across the, on the phone and 
complete the questionnaire, or if you don't like that or if you don't have access, you can request that a form be sent to you, and you can fill that out. My 96-year-old mother-in-law isn't online. So. Right. So she probably won't um, want to answer the questions. <laughs> Somebody could help her, right. certainly, and, right. and, and, and a lot of senior citizens, senior centers, and other places where people might be living, particularly the senior population, that that's one of the big concerns around sure. the online, um, that you, can, you will have census workers out there helping. You will have kiosks set up. You will have senior centers, which will be helping their, their residents also to fill the questionnaires. You know, when you hear the word online, you, the, one of the first words that occurs is hacked. Right. Is, there anybody, is there any danger someone could hack, uh, hack in and say, well, you know, there's 2 million people in Pleasant Ridge right. now. Kurt right. needs a lot more There money. we go. There. <laughs> That's a lot of overcrowding. Um, Yes, that, that is the big, of course, with all the hacking that's going on and all this concern about hacking, that's where the fear is that people are going to really, not, not necessarily that they're going to be hacked because the Census Bureau is doing everything they can around uh, cybersecurity and, and the hope is that nothing could possibly happen. But just people introducing that fear and talking about that, the thing is the Census Bureau is not asking questions that are going to really cause much concern. You're, you're answering a lot more information when you're getting a, a, a bank loan or you're filling out a credit card application or you're on Facebook. You tell right. more about yourself on Facebook than the census is going to ask you. So I think the phrase is TMI. It, yep. uh, exactly. But are, are you working closely, planning on working closely with the census folks, Nancy? Yes, we are. Um, it, you know, it's a natural collaboration, right? And so um, what we're trying to get... Um, the message out to, you know, in our presentations is to say, yes, the complete count is, is, is critically important for our state and our programs and people's lives. And then that data is going to be the raw material for our election district. If I remember correctly, correct me either, you, we get state population counts around December. But what, when do you get the detailed, when are you expecting the detailed data you'll need to draw these districts? I think we're expecting it around March of 2021. Does that make sense? Around it March? has to be, by law, you have December 31st, you have to give the state total, so for the reapportionment, and by April 1st of 2021, you have to release the data down to the block level that will be used for redistricting. Two other yeah. que census questions. Yeah. Number one, what percentage of people are actually visited by a new, an enumerator? Well, the only reason you're going to be visited by enumerators is if you don't respond the first time around. And there's an expectation that probably almost up to 30% of the population will have to be visited. Wow. Um, and there's, that's where the costs are. I mean, that's... It's like 100 million people almost. Right. And, and, and so we're, the, the issue is the, the more people you can get to respond... Obviously, the more uh, accurate the census is, but it also saves money. And so there's always this big issue in Washington of how much money needs to be allocated to the census. Um, and again, because of problems with money, the census hasn't tested a lot of these procedures, or at least tested them as much as they have in the in previous censuses. So there's still a question of how this is going to be received, what exactly the response is. That's why this whole outreach effort. And it's interesting, the state of California has already allocated $100 million to the census. Wow. And, and Newsom is looking to add another $54 That's million. That's the governor, Gavin Newsom. Govern, yeah. And in Michigan, luckily, we've got, I haven't seen the budget, but $5 million in the state budget. But last year, the Michigan Nonprofit Association got, got started on the census and really took leadership put together foundation money close to $5 million, distributed to hubs around the state in Southeast Michigan. It's the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. They then put out an RFP for nonprofits to do outreach in their communities. And so... Um, so while it's a, sta it's a federal yeah. government program, states right. supplement this because of their interest. Because are, of the importance, right. yes, yes. And luckily, Michigan is really getting on board more this year than I've seen in the past. Now, one last, last question. I was at a party the other evening, and there's an elderly lady, and she said she really hoped she didn't get the long form because she hated calling, answering the long form and all these intrusive questions. That doesn't exist anymore, does it? No, my mother got the long form two, year, two censuses in a row and blamed me for it. Um, <laughs> but, no, there's a short form, and that's it. Um, the Census Bureau, back in um, the mid-2000s, came up with something called the American Community Survey. 
<clears throat> which is an annual survey. In fact, data just came out last Thursday. We saw about income and poverty and education and a number of other um, uh, demographic uh, variables. So all those kinds of questions are asked in a survey form. So on the census, you're only asked um, your age, your name, your age, your race, whether you're Hispanic or not, and whether you own your home or rent. It's very, That's very all? basic information, yes. Wow. So, hmm. Nothing to be worried about. Nancy Wang, if people are, are interested in the voters, not politicians process, and I don't know who wouldn't be, how do they find out more? Do you have a website? Do you have a place you can... Yes, I would encourage them to go online, www.votersnotpoliticians.com. And what we're doing now is, you know, as I mentioned, the application process is actually going to open later this year. But what we're um, encouraging people to do is sign up to our list so that they can get information from VNP um, about, you know, when applications will open or, you know, if they want to hear more about the process or the position. Great. Kurt, the census used to hire a whole bunch of temporary folks. And if you want a job with the census, how do you do that? They are hiring now. You can go, um, I'm seeing a lot of actual advertisements. I'm seeing in, in various nonprofits, they've got signs out, fill out the census. I was out in Oakland County for a complete count effort and they already had signs up. Um, so you can go to the census website, um, census.gov and, and, or 2020census.gov. I'm not, you can actually, you can also go to the Michigan nonprofit site. Um, it's very easy to find. Um, information on jobs. They are hiring now. Um, there's some jobs they're actually right now in the process of checking addresses across the country, going out and verifying address lists because that's what the base of the census is. Um, so there are people doing that and obviously there are people getting more along the partnership, getting information out there and there will be more hiring as we continue to go on. And then May is the big month where the follow up on the non-response. When the census is complete, we have all this data, can marketers go in and get this micro data and use this to contact you or use it to find out things about you? No. Um, again, the census is confidential. What it does is it aggregates information. So there is information, you will be able to get information for, your, for the nation, for your state, for your county, for your city, your township, your village, and you can get it down to the census block level. Which is how many people? It's usually about, could be a hundred. I mean, think about your block when you, if you walk around your block, um, how many homes are in that particular block and how many people are there. Um, we tend to talk about census tracts, which are about 4,000 people. Um, it's one of the building blocks, but um, it, so I it find gets out. down to small levels, but it does not uh, identify individual. So I could find out that there were like 34% Asian Americans in Nancy Wang's block, but right. I couldn't find out exactly who lived where. That's right. That's and, right. Until 70 years? 72. 72 yeah. years afterwards. That's which right. was which was done originally because that was the thought of the lifespan now. Lifespans are longer, and there was talk about extending that, but we're sticking with 72. Well, probably most people don't live in the same place they did right. 72. Nancy, any last comments you'd like to make about VNP or that you'd like people to be aware of? Well, I just want to say that, um, you know, this is a really exciting time for uh, Michigan, um, and we're about to have a, a citizen-led redistricting commission, and I encourage everyone to apply. Now, are you folks, having been so successful at this, going to take on any other issues? Have you had any other referenda planned? Well, um, I think that's definitely part of our long-term plan. There's a lot to do to clean up uh, politics, um, and, uh, and we're here, and we have um, the people like all across the political spectrum who are interested in doing more work. I would think getting rid of term limits might be the best uh, possible thing, but that's my editorial point of view. Kurt, anything else about the census I haven't asked you? No, I just, I just want to reiterate its importance, the fact that it's confidential, the fact that the Census Bureau is doing everything they can to make it easy. Um, and they're also, the questionnaires are in, in English and, and Spanish, but there are also 12 online. There will be 12 or 12 other languages. There will be some 59 languages that you can get um, assistance so that you make, make phone calls. There, every effort is being made. There's a lot of good information out there. There's great stuff in the schools, education, utilizing the census in schoolwork. Um, so I think people need to learn a little bit more about the census, nothing to be afraid of, no personal information. Don't 
let anybody call you and, and tell you that they're from the census and they need your social security number or anything like that. The census Bureau does not ask that. So, be, I mean, the biggest thing I think we have to worry about is people who are going to take advantage. They always do. Um, people are going to start parading around as census workers. We've got census have identifications. It's very clear. Don't let anybody in your house without a U.S. Census. Exactly, exactly. And don't don't give any information over the phone um, unless you're call, you're making the call. The Census Bureau is not going to call you. Good point. Well, that's about it for now, except my signature essay coming up. By the way, I want to thank everyone who donated to help fund the production costs of this podcast, including Fred Frank, the president of Temple Emanuel in, in Oak Park, and Marion McClellan, the mayor of Oak Park, and her husband, Keith, who once worked in Bobby Kennedy's campaign. If you'd like to help keep these podcasts going, I'd be thrilled if you could send a contribution to me via the Zing Media Group, 186 North Main Street in Plymouth. That's 48170. Or message me on Facebook or via my blog for more details. Again, please check out my blog, lessonburyinc.com. Inc. is an ink pen. And click the button and subscribe. The price is right. It's free. And listen to our next episode, too, soon. Tell your friends. And let me know what you think. In the meantime, I'm off to work on our next podcast, which will examine whether there really is justice in our court system today. This is Jack Lessonberry with Politics and Prejudices. I'll see you soon. I think it's sort of amazing that the United States has been making an effort to count each and every one of its residents every 10 years since 1790, when there was no transportation other than horses and carts, few decent roads, and absolutely no modern technology or record-keeping of any kind other than paper and ink. That first census found there were 3.9 million people in the nation, and both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were convinced that there was a significant undercount. I'm sure they were white right. I don't know how it would have been possible to find and enumerate every trapper off in the backwoods. Michigan, by the way, wasn't even mentioned, in part because the British hadn't bothered to leave yet, and there were probably no more than a few thousand white people scratching out a hard scrabble existence here. Well, it's almost two and a half centuries later. Michigan has 10 million people. We have satellites capable of spotting and tracking folks from space, social media everywhere, and we're still undercounting our population. It matters a whole lot more than it did in 1790. For one thing, states and communities get money for a lot of programs based on how many people live there. For one other thing, political representation is based on population. Every congressional district in each state has to have exactly the same number of people, give or take, only one. Legislative districts have to be almost as equal. When people get missed, communities are underrepresented. And the poor and homeless and those who live on the edges of society are the ones most likely to be missed. My guess is that we don't have much of an undercount in Gross Point or Bloomfield Hills, but they do in certain parts of Detroit. We need a complete count, and we need to draw districts that are not only as equal as possible, we need to draw ones that keep communities of, of common interests together and are drawn to assure a special political outcome. Apart from partisans' considerations, it makes no sense that Kalamazoo and Battle Creek aren't in the same congressional district, and even less sense that Farmington and Farmington Hills are in different congressional districts. In the legislature, some districts are so partisan, the one re-elected a representative a few years ago who had been convicted of eight felonies and had been charged with sexually abusing a male aide. He later resigned when more felonies surfaced. This makes no sense. The vast majority of voters agree with me. I know this because they enacted the Voters Not Politicians Amendment last year by a landslide. The Republicans are still doing everything they can to try and thwart fairness and the will of the people by doing everything from filing lawsuits to trying to cut the redistricting appropriation and take back control of the process. This is no longer an issue of partisanship, but one of trying to save our democracy. We must do everything we can to keep this from happening. Thanks for listening, and I hope to be back with you again soon. I'm Jack Lessonberry. Thank you.